Welcome to the Data Product Management in Action podcast, created and executive produced by me, Scott Herleman, and brought to you by Soda, your best friend in data quality and contracts tooling. We created this podcast to serve as a place for actual practitioners bringing product management practices to data, whether that is to AI and ML, data products, platforms, or everything else in data, right? And it's to dig into the, the nitty gritty of product management in data, but in fun and dynamic conversations. It's not just lift and shift from software product management. We have a great set of hosts for you that are also practitioners, so they can really get into those specifics and, and dive deep and get you the information you want to know rather than just high level, here is what a data product is. This is about cutting through the noise of data product management to drive towards actionable insights, hence the actual podcast name, Data Product Management in Action. So sit back and enjoy another awesome conversation. Your host today is Michael Tolan, Senior Product Manager at Testable. A reminder, again, that all hosts and guests are only representing their own views. Hey, everyone. This is the Data Product Management in Action podcast. I am your host, Michael Toland, and I am thrilled to be joined uh, today with my guest, Panos. Um, he is a data product manager who got a start um, by being a data analyst and working within business intelligence. And we're going to talk about how does one get started in this? What needs to be true about your team to effectively build data products? And I'm super excited. Um, Panos, welcome to the Data Product Management in Action podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Michael. Um, yes, this is this is actually a, a question that I'm being asked uh, quite often and I'm uh, quite passionate about because if you ask 10 product managers how did they start their career in product, you're going to get 10 different answers. And... Um, there is there is a common theme which you know always says if you want to become a product manager, no matter what kind of product manager and what no matter what you're doing, you should probably start from your from within your own organization because you know what they're doing, you know the pain points of their clients, of their users, or of internal stakeholders, and that is probably you know the problems that you already know how to solve. So you know you have a lot of the qualities, not all, but a lot of the qualities that will help you become. A product manager and that's actually how i started as well so yeah i was working in a mar market research firm in Cantar uh, in london and uh, i was yeah a data analyst or insights analyst i started moving into bi i started playing a bit with microsoft power bi as a you know dashboarding tool which to me it looked um you know quite modern and amazing and uh, a much better way to deliver the data that the company was selling uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of Excel reports or a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, as I was building more and more products, more and more, sorry, dashboards back then, uh, I realized that, you know, I was, I was very interested in building them, of course, but I was more interested in kind of going out there and asking the clients what, what is, you know, what they really need, what are their problems, and trying to see how we can solve, how I could solve these problems with the data that I had available at my disposal back then. So this is how I gradually uh, transitioned into a product manager who was actually selling this kind of new for, uh, product, this kind of new dashboard, or now we'll call it reporting data product. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, as, far as, as far as the team uh, that uh, I had in my disposal uh, back then, there was not, you know, so much of a team. I mean, I was a data analyst. I was a BI analyst. I was, of course, a product owner, kind of defining the vision of the product suite. I was, dare I even say, the data engineer, because, okay, we were using data from Excel. So maybe the analytics engineer kind of formatting the data in order to push them into the, uh, the tool. And even sometimes I was even doing the same. Gradually, as um, you know, the, the brands that I was working with in Kantar called Europanel was quite innovative and I was had actually a very supportive manager. Uh, back then, uh, gradually, I was allowed to kind of focus on what I was doing best and I was getting some other resources from, you know, the rest of the business to help me with some of these tasks. There was not a dedicated product team per se because, you know, I think Especially for that brand, I was certainly the first product manager. Um, 
And that is a very large business. I don't know if there was somebody else, but certainly it was very, very early days. And yeah. And, well, I mean, even to that point, I think um, so many organizations don't even think about how to structure their data team in the product sense. You know, and that's something that I want to chat about. But like, I, I want to go back to something you said real specifically. As you were getting started, you said you had a manager who was really supportive of the sort of transition. I'm curious, you know, when you say they supported you, um, what did that look like? Like, what did it take when you started to apply sort of this product level thinking to data? What did the support from your manager look like? Um, and then what friction might you have had from like others who may just not have understood the the, the transition towards this spot. Absolutely. So um, to be clear, back then, there were no resources around about data product management. I mean, this is no. a brand new. Right? Still not a lot. There's still not a lot, although, yeah, I do see more and more. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there was, there was absolutely nothing back then. I had read about what product management is. I was trying to relate it to what I was doing. And I could, you know, I had get a lot of, a lot of good arguments to go and pitch to my manager and say, look, I mean, we're having, we're creating these dashboards. This is the thinking, the product thinking that we should apply to them. And look, what am I doing? I mean, I am kind of becoming a product manager for that. Uh, I pitched to get a, a course, the, the CSPO, the Certified uh, Scrum Product Owner course, you know, back then, because again, not even for product management, there were enough course, you know, to pick from. So, yeah, my manager back then, he was quite, um, you know, he was quite into innovative things. Uh, the brands I was working in, this uh, Euro panel brands within Kantar, was also quite, you know, into innovative uh, things as well. But certainly there was some friction because there was something, you know, brand new. We were selling, um, you know, our data to clients in a completely different way in the past. And, you know, I mean... I, I cannot complain that there was a lot of friction, but, you know, to some, to some extent, yeah, you could see something, you know, expectable in terms of, okay, what are we doing here? Why should we change since this is paying us? You know, why, why should we go another way? To be fair, I have seen more friction in other kind of more product-led organizations rather than what, uh, rather than what I saw there. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, it's all about how you pitch something in terms of, again, you know, kind of arguing or, well, pitching for, a, for, a, for the need to have a data product team or a product team, you should approach it as a product by itself. Like you need to understand the pain points that this is going to solve, understand the need, uh, and somehow try to monetize it as well, right? That's what I did back then. And this certainly helped me. It helped me more than what I would have expected. Yeah. And I think you're specifically talking about, uh, you know, monetizing something to an external market, right? Because there's different data products that we have for external markets that are typically something that's driving revenue for our organizations, as opposed to internal data products, which may not be revenue drivers, but could be um, tools to help facilitate decision making or internal products that just help reduce costs. And I think it's really important to distinguish what we're talking about. And so in this case, external data products that are revenue drivers for organization. I'm curious, based on that, um, that research that you've done and sort of the, the work, like when, when, you, when you were starting to apply the sort of product management way of thinking to these data assets, what did you start with? Because I've been in this role of a product manager for a while. But I still find it tough to think about, like, how do I monetize? And, like, how do I even start to think about valuing data um, to drive revenue? Now, granted, you were already, you said you were already um, publishing dashboards that your external clients uh, were, were consuming. What changed about it? Back then, in Canada, it was way more straightforward because, yeah, there was a kind of direct data monetization uh, stream. Uh, the truth is that in my uh, subsequent roles in uh, Sky and uh, now at The Economist, the situation is completely different because, yeah, up until, I mean, with a few exceptions around advertising, uh, you know, and audience data monetization, we're not selling uh, the data. So it is much, much harder to monetize. I mean, as you said, there are 
cost savings, efficiency gains, which you can potentially relate with the salaries of people, you know, at the time they're spending. So, yeah, this can be, um, you know, this can be an avenue. But again, you're not building data products only for revenue uh, saving. You are building for a sort of cost savings. You're building data products to, as you said, facilitate and enable uh, and inspire better and more accurate uh, decisions. Um, now, if a marketing manager sees my analytics, my reporting data product, my dashboard, let's say, you know, more in more simple terms, uh, and makes a decision and, you know, launches a campaign that gets us, I don't know, like a thousand or 10,000 or 1 million new customers, it doesn't mean that you can go out and claim all of that revenue and say that, yeah, okay, thanks to me. <laughs> It would be really nice, but uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, it's not uh, it's not exactly how it works. Um, it is for, for me. Um, we need to take a step back, right, and understand. Okay, what do you really need to monetize? You need to monetize it because you want to uh, prioritize, probably. If we ask ourselves, you know, how do we prioritize things? I mean, and everyone can follow their own prioritization framework from a simple value versus effort matrix to, you know, more kind of elaborate rice or a, or a Kano models. Um, what we really need is a consistent way to define the relative value between the different initiatives, the different priorities. If this is you know, through money, that's, you know, that's all good because, yeah, as a society, you know, as societies and as, a, as, a, as humanity in general, we have agreed that the value of this thing, you know, of a dollar or of a, of a, a pound is, is what it is. And, you know, we're, we're using that to compare, you know, the value of thing. But with other products, I have often found that, you know what, if we can use another kind of currency, if it is harder, you know, for us to actually monetize it. If, I mean, if the purpose is to prioritize, to decide which opportunity to pursue, that's what you really need, a common kind of currency to compare these different initiatives. It doesn't always have to be money. Because I have tried a lot and very hard <laughs> to monetize. And, you know, at the end, you end up having arbitrary values that mean very little to most people. And you're saying, okay, why should I use that? And why don't I use, you know, um, another way to compare between all of these different initiatives and be actually more consistent, more accurate, and more uh, straightforward about, uh, about it? Yeah, I have found that it really depends on, like, what's the organizational strategy that, that the entire organization is pursuing? And then given that strategy, which I, I like to think, um, I think that was Melissa Perry who cited someone who said a strategy is just a framework by which we make decisions. Um, and then from there, what data do I have access to that can help me lead that strategy to make better decisions? Um, does my strategy involve, you know, monetizing that data or does it um, leverage building out my data in such a way that makes decision making faster or more, more confident? Um, I'm really avoiding the word certainty at all costs right now because I think we've gotten too far towards like this absolute certainty mindset. So I'm trying to uncouple that. Um, but I think really, you know, starting from to your words, um, what problem can this data solve? And really rooting myself in if it's something that's external, what job is this product solving for my client that they otherwise can't solve or they're going about a circuitous way to solve it? Or internally, what problem are we unable to solve because our data is not in the right structure? And so I really appreciate sort of your context there. Um, and I'm, I'm interested, you know, a, a lot of this tends to be ambiguous on how we apply data to strategy work um, and how strategy informs what we do with data. And so I'm curious, um, and I'm jumping around a bit from some of the questions I had sent over, but really, how do you help? your colleagues and your business and your stakeholders get clarity on that specific problem and how data can solve it um, in order to sort of sell this idea of moving from our traditional siloed way of thinking about data into a more holistic way of applying product thinking towards building out these data assets. It's a long-winded question. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, quite a few points uh, here. So um, starting with 
yeah, how to bring the clarity to uh, my colleagues or to my stakeholders uh, on how uh, data can solve the problem. Actually, you know, it all starts with pretty much what you said at the beginning with the organizational strategy. You know, what is what is the top priority? What did the CEO name as the top priority of the business? This is, you know, where you need to go, right? I mean, and if you don't have that, maybe take a step back and say, where is, you know, follow the money pretty much. Like, where is most of our revenue generated or most of our course, uh, cost, you know, coming from? And map this in a, you know, similar to a journey mapping, you know, for users. Map in which exact touch points, you know, which, which touch point is the one that's actually generating most of the revenue or kind of taking away most of the cost and try to focus on how data can help you optimize there and maybe either, you know, help you get more revenue or uh, reduce your cost. And by having these priorities, you know, clear, like, okay, this is where we need to focus. It's actually your job, not your colleague's job to, uh, your job as a data product manager, I mean, to think of the ways that data can help, right? They can only tell you about the problems. Uh, they cannot tell you about the solution. It's, you know, your job as a, th there is a very famous saying that allegedly, uh, Henry Ford said, I, you know, I was there. I really don't know <laughs> if he said it, but you know, he had said, if I had asked my customers what they want, they would have told me faster horses. So, you know, I really don't know if he indeed said that. I mean, I saw it somewhere, you know, in, in LinkedIn or something like that, but I really like it, you know, as a mindset, like. Your customers, your stakeholders, your users can only tell you what the problem is, but it's your job to find the right solution. So this problem, you know, their problem can be solved with data. Maybe there are other ways to solve it, you know, without data. But it's my job, you know, to go there and say, look, this is the problem that you, uh, the pain point anyway, that you, that you identify, that we identify together in a workshop, in an interview, in something. This is how I believe it can be solved with data. This is how we're going to measure its success. Then, you know, if you like it, I need your help to go and convince, you know, somebody higher up to invest on it and say, you know, we are, we are going to solve this. Um, now, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is the approach that I have been taking. And uh, so far, it hasn't disappointed. It's not, that it, it's, every, it's not that it's everything perfect always, but, you know, like so far it works. Well, and even if, if, if it's not like the end-all be-all, it is a starting point to help you provide clarity around, okay, I've got this, I've got this strategy that I understand from my executives. Where do I fit in? Let me tie to your point, like almost a journey map of how our business makes money and how this problem could potentially be solved. Um, let me understand and root more into that problem. And I think that, um, you know, oftentimes... Uh, we will get what uh, is passionately referred to as the HIPAA, the highest paid person's opinion in the room to just grow out a solution. Um, and then, you know, sometimes that solution is rooted in a lot of experience and intuition, and sometimes it works. But most of the time, we find that the vast majority of these sort of mandates don't flow. And so, especially if that solution is a thought and expressed, you know, within a 30 minute meeting, it's like, yeah, okay. It can be a good starting point, but it cannot be that, really. I mean, it needs some proper discovery and some, uh, you know, a really, a really deep thought process to understand what are the alternatives and understand why this uh, is, uh, is going to generate uh, value. Yeah, as you said, you know, HIPPO is a big problem when you are in, a, in any kind of internal product management role. Um, and, you know, urgency, you know, like uh, stakeholders coming, you know, knocking at the door, like, yeah, well, we need this tomorrow and uh, there is no other way we can do this. Look, there is that there are, you know, also, I don't know how many prioritization frameworks that you can apply to your, uh, to your uh, roadmap, but at the very, very end, it ends up in, you know, these two things we just discussed. What are the key priorities of the organization? And also, where is most of the value, where is most of the money, you know, generate or lost? Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, moving ahead then, you know, once, once you kind of have that set up of understanding the problem that needs to be solved and that data is the potential solution for it and they need to build a product for it, 
think something that we talked about when we first um, were introduced to one another was really around what has to be true about my team in order to build a robust data product that meets and solves a problem. And obviously, depending on the problem to be solved you're gonna and, and the data product that needs to be built, your team is going to look a little bit different. But, but sometimes you're going to have some like core team composition of at least like a product manager. So I'm curious from your perspective, because I know you've been thinking a lot about this, is, you know, what should your core composition of a team look like? Um, what roles? And then why those roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the key uh, word you said there is uh, roles. Roles as opposed to job titles. You know, it doesn't mean that these uh, roles that I'm going to name now, they have to be different or, you know, specific uh, job titles. But yes, somebody certainly needs to play the role of the product owner. Again, it doesn't need to be, uh, I mean, not every company needs to go and hire a product, a data product manager now. The role of the product owner can be played by a BI analyst as, you know, I was uh, back then, that's how I transitioned, or an insight analyst that, you know, knows their stakeholders very well, knows their problem, they're working day to day with them. So, you know, th the role is there, product ownership needs to be there, but, you know, it could be potentially covered by other people. Um, there is also the need of having somebody uh, to translate the business kind of requirements into something more technical. Sometimes it's a product manager doing that, a product owner, for example, if they are focusing in a few products, as I was doing, for example, in my previous role, I was playing the role of business analyst as well. Other times, if you're focusing, if you indeed have a product manager that is focusing on many things, then yeah, probably need, you need a business analyst as well, right? Um, then you have the engineers. I mean, you know, there is only so much you can do with the data that you already have available and modeled, you know, in your, uh, in your database, in your data warehouse, data lake you're going to need somebody to either, you know, uh, create new data pipelines, to ingest new data, uh, somebody to do the tagging, you know, the implementation and the capturing, if you were talking about capturing new data. So again, it really depends, you know, on what we're trying to build. I mean, if you want to uh, build, a, um, a, I don't know, personalized experiences, you're going to need an ML engineer, potentially a data scientist as well. Um, if you're trying to build, uh, I don't know, a brand new uh, data platform, you're going to need even software engineers to help you, you know, link with APIs of other systems. So, but I think at the, at its very core, you need the role of the product owner somewhere there and the role of the engineer. And yeah, also I would argue the role of a delivery manager as well. Although I have seen teams surviving, you know, with, without one and the surviving so being the key term. Surviving being the key <laughs> term. Yes, yes, yes. I think if you have a really good product manager and a really good tech lead, um, they split those responsibilities pretty well for the delivery manager. And it, it can really be beautiful when they're both real good. Um, I have both been in a situation where I've had a really great tech lead and we share those responsibilities really well. I've also been where I've had a bad engineer. Um, and that just happens. Like, it's just not their skill set. And I've also been a bad product manager where I was the consternation of a really, really good tech lead and I was early in my career. Um, but luckily they were patient and tough. Um, and so, I'm, I, you know, I think, um, you know, given that you started sort of as an informal product owner, um, you know, managing these data products, um, when, when you started to go down that path, you, you, like we talked about, had support for your boss, but did you face friction from others on your team? Um, or how did you, I guess, if there was no friction, how did you pitch to them this new way of thinking about deploying your data, getting revenue, and, and really sort of viewing it from the lens of building a product as opposed to just, here's a data asset, do what you want? Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I said, in, uh, in the company that I started, uh, especially that brands where they were quite innovative. They wanted to try new things. And because they saw, you know, a revenue from that, they were eager, you know, to support it. I think the concept with which I struggled the most was the concept of MVP. You know, the concept of getting something out there that is not complete. And that is something that, to be honest, I, I struggled with even much later in my career. Um, you know, because 
especially data people, uh, they tend to be very detail oriented. And, you know, they need to be because the data needs to be correct, right? Uh, so actually, uh, you know, telling them that, uh, yeah, okay, this has been tested a bit, uh, but, uh, you know, what I really want to see is how the users, the cl- who are, you know, kind of employees of a client organization, right, uh, back then, are actually playing with a product because I, I care mostly about the design and, you know, the user experience at this moment. It was something that, yeah, it was, I mean, it was harder to land. Anyway, and as I said, yeah, le- much later in my career as well, wh- even when we're talking about internal stakeholders, but perhaps very senior ones, and I was like, okay, let's launch an MVP and see, you know, what what do they need from this dashboard, for example. It goes, yeah, it goes, it goes much harder. I mean, had to focus on data quality first, uh, and uh, you know, the nitty nitty gritty details before you know getting something out there, which was, yeah, I mean. You know, it's part of the job, right? I mean, you need to balance across across many things. And that's why I say that data product managers are certainly product managers, but there are and the very, very basic principles of product manager of product management apply. But they are kind of a different breed. I mean, there are different objectives, different processes, and some kind of very, very different principles. Um, you can, you know, push live a dashboard. A, a dashboard product, a reporting product out there that might not have all the features, but the data needs to be correct. You know, you, so there are, yeah, there are a, there are a way a minimal of, threshold for like data quality. Um, you know, is, is my data going to be for my MVP 90% accurate? Like 10% inaccuracy is pretty, pretty bad, but also there's a lot of data sets in the world and of organizations that are just really poorly maintained. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think the, the piece there, particularly if you're launching an MPP internally is having those set established metrics to say, we know we're not going to be perfect, but we want your response to this to say, Hey, here's what we're building. What's working about it. What isn't, um, to your point, doing research with the consumer, which can be different than the purchaser on what are the attributes that you absolutely need to have to get the job done that you want to, to want to perform. Uh, exactly. And uh, may, may I make a couple of points here? Yeah. Uh, for any kind of monetized data product that I can imagine, the consumer will be mm-hmm. that, hey, That's almost a given. Being a long time for me to realize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for data products, yes. Because, okay, these are products that people pay usually a lot of money to buy. Uh, so we're talking about larger organizations with procurement, for example, and, and things like that. Uh, another very important point that I have came to realize, you know, more more recently is that um, it has to do with data maturity, uh, which is similar to data literacy, but it's not exactly the same. Data maturity is all about, you know, people knowing what they want out of, knowing what data can give them and what they can ask you. If you go and you gather requirements before you launch pro, uh, a dashboard, I mean, we're talking too much about dashboard, but anyway, uh, before you launch a dashboard, you're going to get, you know, you're going to feel like Santa Claus and you're going to have a list of that many requirements and, you know, you have to cater for all of them and then it's going to be a much harder decision to say, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't think it's important or we can't. If you launch a prototype dashboard or an MVP dashboard, people start using it. They understand the value of this data. They understand how exactly this data can help them. They become more data mature. And then the next round of iterations, you're going to have much more specific, valuable, straightforward, well-defined requirements to work. So that's, that's something that, yeah, it took me a while to uh, realize I wanted to capture, you know, as many requirements as I could up front so that I can set up a roadmap for the product and, you know, uh, it's spring planning and everything. But I think that, you know, you need to get something out fast let people play with it and let them understand the value that they could potentially get from more features, from more data points, from more uh, models or calculations or whatever. Yeah, I think the other thing also is like, just because they come to you with that laundry list of requirements that they want, the question really is, well, you want this, but it's our job as product people to figure out what do you need, Um, which is so 
it, it, you have to really embed yourself within the domain context of the of the data asset that you're building for them. Um, because I don't know about you, but I have often been um, not the primary owner of the data product that I'm building as far as the domain context. I had to learn it quickly, interview, and be like, well, what is the use of this data? And what do you actually use from this from the subset of a table to drive your decisions or to make a prediction or to, you know, qualify? I did a lot of work um, during my time at a telecom working on promotion decisioning and automating that and building out a reference data platform to support it. Um, and that was always one of the things that I had to constantly go back to our marketing team is like, well, you say you want this, but like, what are you trying to get done so that I know what you need to have as opposed to what you want? And it is so simple, yet so hard to implement that thinking because it goes back to the hippo uh, point that you mentioned earlier. Like, you know, imagine, yeah, an executive uh, coming to you and saying, that's what I want. And then you ask me, yeah, but do you really need this? You know, it, it, I don't have what card that goes. You know? <laughs> well, I said I wanted it. Just get it for me. And then they expect, and it's like, well, do you need this one time? Do you need this quarterly? Do you need, like, just, you know, sometimes I think we don't ask enough questions. And I think that yeah. it goes back to the fact that this person's a hippo or they're a senior leader. I don't want to be disparaging to senior leaders. There's a lot of good ones out there. I've worked with yeah, them. And, you know, I mean, there is a reason why they're senior. I mean, and more often than not, you know, the, their questions, I mean, and, the, the business questions that they won't answer th through your data products are going to be quite valid. It's actually you that you get most of the help, you know, when you go that much deeper because you understand more what is the vision of this product and how it's going to be used. And it helps you also define the right success metrics. But this gets me to another point uh, that, yeah, as I said, we're talking too much about dashboards because it has been, you know, embedded and still in the data product philosophy that, yeah, there are ML and data science products, there are data monetization, you know, and APIs and things like that. There is a data platform uh, products, and then there are the reporting products that have to be dashboard. They don't have to be that. For me, it is, although I started my career through that, and, you know, I'm thankful uh, for my involvement with dashboards, and I have missed, actually, uh, some of it. And um, I think that, you know, People need data to help them do their jobs and, you know, make some uh, decisions better. If you really want to help them, you have to instill this, to embed this in their workflows. Like, am I in, I don't know, in Salesforce, uh, setting up a campaign, or am I in another tool, uh, doing, you know, another kind of marketing or product activity? This is where I want the data. I don't want to open a new tab go to my dashboard and my visualization tool, um, go through, you know, uh, the uh, single sign-on or the authorization, you know, that the, your IT team has uh, set up and check, you know, authorize it from my phone, then go to a massive list of dashboards and then do the filtering that I need to do to get the data that I need and then go back to where I was to make the decision. I need it there. I need, you know, this is what um, decision support systems are all about. Like, you know, help me make that, help me, yeah, help me make an action, like activate this data where I need it, when I need it, not, you know, through another system that still, you know, I need to think about it and I'm looking at the right thing. You know, it is, it is a mindset that I do see the industry moving towards. Um, but again, you know, as all things, it's going to take some time. It is. I think the thing that often it goes, um, undervalued in the world of data products is truly good design um you know i could have a table that's a data product depending on depending on whether i'm monetizing it or if that data is going to be like a fact table for instance that's going to be like single source of truth um and then how do how do i build the framework for which we make decisions off of those data um i think something that like i just said goes under underappreciated is the value of designing that process well in a way that product managers are usually pretty good about some rudimentary getting an MVP out. But when I'm starting to think through like consumption and the design of that consumption, whether it is on the data platform side, which we have 
horribly designed a lot of data platforms for the engineers and the consumers and producers on those platforms. But then on the product side specifically, it's something that we often are taking for granted that folks within a data space and are consuming a domain that they're familiar with will um, not need something robust and intuitive in the way that we think like a mobile application um, is really, really focused on design. And I'm curious if you've had experience with that where you've had to actually bring in maybe a classic user experience designer to apply to a data product. Unfortunately, I never had that chance, although it is something that I, I, am, I am pushing myself to think that it's, it's what, I was, uh, I, what I was telling you last time we talked. It's about the end-to-end -end experience. It's not about, I mean, you know, data organizations in general might only think about the design when, you know, starting from the point, okay, the user is in the dashboard. And what does happen next? Yes, indeed, there are now visualization techniques that help you, you know, kind of build a very easy to navigate and user-friendly dashboard, but that's not the end-to-end -end user experience. The user experience is, as a user, I am in this tool setting up a campaign, or as a user, I am... So indeed, you need to bring... Is this old visualization theory about ink and paper, you know, using the minimum ink and paper, you know, to communicate information. You need to bring information, the information that they need, where they need it, when they need it, in the most kind of seamless way. Is this, I don't know, uh, a chatbot potentially in Slack or in Microsoft Teams, while they are doing their work to be able, you know, to ask this chatbot and say, um, I don't know, how did this campaign perform, you know, last, uh, last week? You know, a simple question and answering techniques. Is this, as you said, a table with, I don't know, 5, 10, 20 of the most important data points or KPIs, you know, looking at them there and actually kind of maybe even print, you know, this table and stick it next to your screen. Like the whole point is what do I need? When do I need it? Where do I need it? And of course, why do I need it? And this is, this is what really, you know, user experience is all about when it comes to data. And of course, yeah, I do think that there is a lot of space for user experience uh, designers to come in play when you are creating data products, even if, yeah, a large part of data products is all about, you know, from system, from one system to another. Yeah, but at the end, they're there to help some humans do their job or make some decisions. And this is where you need, you know, to map the, the experience and the journey of the user and, you know, really try to get them, give them this value as fast and, you know, efficiently as you well, I think even when you're talking about end-to-end, -end, like the ingestion point is so right for good experience design. Um, I attended the 2023 Data Connect conference um, put on by Women in Analytics here in Columbus, Ohio, and Cassie um, Kezerkov, I believe was her name. She was the chief, former chief decision officer and scientist at Google, um, and she's left now at a stealth startup, but um, she talked about the importance of ingestion being where if I ask someone, let's say their their um, city of birth, and let's say it's Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the ways that people are in are filling out a form, for instance, if there's not like um, you know clear validations, um, you're going to get maybe fifty different spelling of Philadelphia. Um, typos, what have you. And she, she really talked about design at the end to end experience when we're building data products starts at your moment of capture. Um, I think that's something that social media sites have done really well with is if you think about Facebook, Meta, X, um, Instagram, those are all just data ingestion points for them to later sell that data to marketing. And they've created a very delightful experience that we all just hand our data over. And I think that's a really interesting use case um, to examine um, specifically on just how design factors into this process because I think it it consistently gets undervalued. Absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, things are going to get much better on that front out of necessity because, you know, with third-party cookies going away, actually this kind of zero-party data, like the data that users are almost voluntarily giving away to you. I mean, you know, there is the first part, the behavioral side that you're tracking anyway as part of service delivery. 
but yeah, I don't need to know your gender or where you're from um, or your age, for example, to to give you access to my app. Usually, I mean, with with some exceptions. So everything around the way that users are sharing voluntarily their data is going to become so much more important. It is already extremely important, but it's going to become even more so. And I do think that eventually we're going to see, and we are seeing, I mean, I am seeing really good tools, like, for example, Typeform, um, which is a really, really nice, engaging, and straightforward way to share your data in. Yeah. Um, I I couldn't agree more on that front. I think also there's... Um... There was a really good TED talk by, I forget his name, but he's at OpenAI and one of their heads. But um, he talked about this design for humans in artificial intelligence. But then now that we have these sort of large language models and these interface of chatbots that are really robust, how are we starting to design artificial intelligence agents and design those to talk to one another without a human face? So kind of the API layer, but a lot more robust than anything we've seen. And it's Something that I don't understand yet. Um, AI is kind of like a big mysterious black box to myself, to a lot of people. Um, maybe I'll unpack that um, eventually. But you know, um, I can't. I can't sort of un unthink these thoughts now that I have, as I've worked in this space about how important you know design has been. Um, you know, as we close up here, then you know, obviously you you've had quite a lot of experience in this space, and I'm curious, you know. Um, this is something that I tend to ask all of our guests, which is, you know, what's a mistake that you've made that you learned a lot from that you think would be able to help someone who's fledgling um, in this space in the future? Either, you know, this space can feel really alone because it's still relatively new and we're only now starting to see more content about it. Um, and the fact that, like, we all make mistakes, all of us. And I think we need to talk more about the mistakes we make, ignore those I've made, a ton of them. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, what's a mistake that you value the lessons learned from? Yeah, I I do think one of, um, I mean, at the very, very beginning of this transition to a product manager, it's it's something I kind of mentioned around, you know, uh, your users can tell you the problem. You need to think of the solution. And so I was building a dashboard. Um I'm not, I'm not going to go to the specifics, but anyway, I had pitched this dashboard to a to an internal CEO of a, you know, kind of a local branch. Uh, he loved the idea. He was giving the requirements. He was never supposed to use this dashboard. So I built it based on his requirements. I was super excited. You know, it was um, kind of the first one that I was taking as a product manager in a sense. So I was like, wow, if I do that right, you know, I'm going to have or I'm going to get credit from somebody very senior and smart and everything. Um, but yeah, eventually the dashboard was not for him to use. It was for, you know, my lower level employees. And when I actually got it out there, they were looking a bit like, hmm, okay, yeah, that's nice. That's cute. But, you know, so I had to redesign it from scratch. And I'm very, very happy that I made this mistake so early because it is one of the most important uh, thing, like for a product manager or for, I guess for anybody, you know, to learn is like design and build for the user. If the user is happy, then the customer, the decision maker, or, you know, their CEO, they're going to buy in. But you need to make it, you know, uh, to build it for the user. Got it. Yeah, I I 100% have learned that lesson in every single product that I have worked on at times. Yeah. Um, where I didn't listen enough or interpret enough what users were telling me. I think I've gotten better at it, but you know, it's still something that takes a lot of flex. So thanks for sharing. Um, this has been an absolutely delightful discussion. I love your thoughts on sort of like team makeup and the core aspects that you really need. Um, specifically that like, these may not be job titles, but roles that need to just be filled. Um, if you're thinking about building out data products. Um, and so, you know, thank you so much for sharing your experience today. Um, if folks want to follow up with anything that they thought was insightful and contact you, uh, what's a good way that they might be able to reach you? Um, sure, I'm more than happy to uh, to connect and answer questions and share insights uh, through LinkedIn. I think it's uh, it's the best way to reach out. Yeah, got it. Awesome. Uh, we'll be certain to link um, in the show write up to your LinkedIn profile. But you know, again, Panos, it was 
an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Um, thank you so much for, uh, I think, at least for me, you're the first person officially that I'm interviewing on the Data Product Management in Action podcast. So um, super stoked to see where this wow, this goes. And no, no, no. Then. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm real excited. Um, you know, we've got uh, quite a few guests um, lined up. Sounds great. And yeah, the pleasure was all mine. Uh, I really enjoyed this. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. You have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully you got some great actionable insights out of this episode. We're so excited to dig deeper into data product management at its many facets. If you want to engage more with the show, you can follow us on LinkedIn and check out Soda's website at soda.io for more related content around product management in data. And if you are a practitioner bringing product management practices to data and want to potentially be a guest, please check the show notes for a link to apply. And as always, we strongly encourage people from underrepresented groups in tech to apply. Much as I'm a handsome devil, we don't want all our guests only looking like me. So again, let's get excited for more digging into data product management in action.